rain more percent than that. So what this is, is the shades in blue show us where our <coughs> low vacancy areas are. So these are areas of the city that have less than 20% vacancy. Now, in a healthy city, if I said 20% vacancy, people would freak out, because that's really high. But in Detroit, it's really good. Uh, the pink areas are our areas with the highest amount of vacancy. So this was upwards of 50, 60, 80 percent vacancy. But unfortunately, there were still people who lived in those areas. Roughly 10,000 of the city's population lived in a high vacancy area. Now, slightly the good news about that is that I think the perception is people think that the majority of Detroiters are living in really highly populated areas of vacancy, and it's actually quite the opposite. The majority of people are living in our low vacancy areas and the orange and yellow areas, which are the moderate vacancy areas. So these are areas that cover between 20 to 50% vacancy, but they actually house about 300,000 of Detroit's 700,000 population. So this is the reality of what was happening on the ground. And this just breaks it down by the color. So you can see uh, the different colors show you exactly where those vacancies are, and then these diagrams show us what it looks like on the ground, and then we have all the demographics that show us the housing vacancy, the parcel vacancy, and the overall land area <coughs> for each one. And so you can see it's not, there, it's not a nice, neat pattern. You can be in a low vacancy area, and right next door to you can be a really high vacancy area. So it wasn't a really helpful, if you're an urban designer, a physical planner, you know, it was very hard to transcribe the nice, neat urban village around everything. It was much more fine-grained and integrated. So the city had not revised its land use and zoning since 1957. So this is the current land use map of the city. And you can see um, that a large majority of it is residential. And a large majority of that residential is zoned single family. So we like to think of Detroit as this industrial city with smokestacks and factories and so forth. But most of what it looks like is fairly suburban. It's single family homes with detached garages. Our strategy was to recognize that most of that density was no longer sustainable and not likely to come back. And so how could we make up new kinds of neighborhoods using the land that we have and using the population that we had to retain them and also attract others by thinking about new types of housing choices and new types of neighborhoods people would want. So within this, we changed the overall distribution of land to maybe 22% traditional neighborhoods, 22% green neighborhoods, 22% landscapes, and 15% industrial or commercial. And so each of those different, what we call land use typologies, looks like this when you break it out so you can see where they are. Um, and they are very much informed by that framework zone map. So given what was happening on the ground, gave us an indication of the eligibility of what type of new neighborhood typology was going to have the, the best likelihood of being sustainable. And then we developed, and I know this is hard to see, we developed all of these development types. So within each land use typology, there was a whole range of things you could build in terms of housing, in terms of open space, in terms of commercial. So I'm just going to flash through the different typologies. Uh, this would be our district center. So this area would allow a mix of residential and commercial and retail at various densities. And you can see the map of where we think it's most suitable. This is a live-make neighborhood, so it's like a live-work, but here we want to push the envelope in saying that industry or anything that's productive where you make things, whether it's creative or whether it's a widget or whether it's food, can coexist with residential development. It can coexist in terms of being next to each other, but can also coexist in the same building. We have green residential where we take some of those moderate vacancy areas and instead of deploying an infill strategy where you build it back as traditional residential, that you actually think about some different types of both open space and residential developments that you can do. As a part of some of our landscape typologies, one is we call innovative productive. And this is where, in addition to food cultivation, which we do think is important, although it's not field cultivation, 
We think that landscapes can do things like clean soil. That all these things and plants that we think are weeds uh, actually have really amazing properties that are cleaning toxins out of soils. And in some of the areas that we know we're not going to develop for the next 30 years, why not actively and aggressively plant these materials that allow this land to be cleaned over time so that we actually can go housing on it sometime in the future. Uh, ecological landscapes is an example of that. The other thing that we wanted to look at in our neighborhoods was what we call quality of life. So a lot of time as physical planners, we're very hung up on doing the diagrams that I showed you that look at density and how the building is formed and architecture. But a lot of times when we were talking to residents, their nomenclature was talking about, is it safe? Is it healthy? Do I have community services? Is there access to a bus stop? Is there recreation? Is there culture? So it's also important for us to overlay onto this a whole series of quality of life elements. And so what we did is, and you'll see this in the plan, so for example, one of our typologies is an urban mixed use neighborhood. We tried to think of strategies that would help community organizations as well as city leaders figure out different programs that they could do. So in a mixed use neighborhood, we wanted everything from an aggressive retail program that would attract retailers to vacant properties, uh, and to things like how you could light special buildings within the district. In our live make neighborhood, we obviously looked at uh, repositioning and rehabbing existing buildings, how you can create training and entrepreneurial programs. So think about you know, the young guy who fixes people's bikes or the shade tree mechanic who's fixing your brother's car, you know, on the sly. You know, how can you train people who have these skills and not only how to do the mechanics of that, but be entrepreneurs so they can start their own businesses and perhaps buy some of the vacant buildings and become real sort of stewards in their own community. In urban green neighborhoods, perhaps we don't demolish in the way we're doing everywhere else, but we think about uh, a more lighter hand of deconstruction where we look at where we can salvage some buildings, the materials of some of the buildings that we're demolishing and repurpose them for other buildings. Um, and in our traditional neighborhoods, this is where a real infill strategy works. And one of the progressive things we talked about was should we begin to look back at the notion of neighborhood-based schools? Um, perhaps some of you are from a time where you could actually just walk to your neighborhood school you were assigned to go. It wasn't uh, such an ordeal to figure out what lottery you were getting into. Um, and it built a sense of stewardship because you were going to school with your neighbors and your parents knew the neighbors and people looked out to their school as opposed to an open enrollment where you're not necessarily place connected. And so in some of our low vacancy areas, we thought that this was a good idea. And then in alternative neighborhoods, we thought you could take some of those roads that you don't need anymore, that are adjacent to lands that you don't need anymore, and deal with the city's really bad stormwater management system. Um, four to five times a year, uh, the sewer overflows into the river. And it's because there's just not enough capacity uh, to handle it, and the, the underground system is so antiquated, things overflow. So you've obviously all had to do a leapfrog over an intersection because it's flooded with water when it rains. Well, how about you take all that surface land and create a lake that can absorb that water over time and have it seep naturally down into the soil as opposed to into a sewer system. Um, the fourth uh, notion, uh, proposition, is the linked city. I'm almost done. Uh, and this is about connected decentralization. So we've got that new land use plan, right? So now let's link that back to how the city is running again. So you don't have enough revenue to pay for services. And you've got this infrastructure system that was built you know, in the 1800s, 1900s. And it's still operating, and it still exists, as if there were 1.8 million people. Which means, on pan, the same rates are higher to pay for service going through an area where no one lives. So everybody's subsidizing the system that no one's using. And so I think we were one of the first cities to, in addition to doing a new land use plan, also did a new infrastructure plan. And what you're looking at here is recognizing that we had to reconfigure the infrastructure based on the density of the area. So on the lower ends, if you're in an area that's in one of those high vacancy areas that's not going to be populated in the same way it was before, it may have another productive use, 
but not as many homes or businesses on it, it needs a different kind of infrastructure. Perhaps it can use more green infrastructure in that area. Perhaps it can use smaller, less wide roadways. Perhaps it doesn't need the same kind of telecom system. It absolutely needs electricity. It absolutely needs water. Those systems would be everywhere. But the levels and capacity with which they run in the city might have to be realized. So this was a really progressive move of ours. And so similar to the framework plan map, we have the map that shows how the redistribution of infrastructure would be run. And then we said, uh, let's transform from 21st century infrastructure that was monofunctional, a road is just for a road, a water pipe is just for a water pipe. Uh, and sometimes, as I showed with the transportation system, it divides communities, meaning we had to, the only way to create it is if I displace you. And move to a 21st century infrastructure that is much more green, that is uh, multifunctional, that services lots of users and can actually be a community asset. So we created these two overlays of blue and green infrastructure maps. This one is our blue infrastructure map uh, where we can look at, uh, we can use the surface lakes and stormwater boulevards um, and other sor sorts of dispersed pond systems to help collect water in air, particularly in areas where we don't need the capacity of the underground pipe to the same extent. And similarly, we can look at green infrastructure where we're looking at um, industrial buffers and we're looking at carbon forests, perhaps along the highways, to help capture some of the emissions from the traffic that's moving through the city. And all of these things kind of pull together to create a new framework of infrastructure that's <coughs> surface-oriented predominantly, that creates amenity and that you can actually use it for passive and sometimes active recreation and can actually help to elevate adjacent property values because you see it and it becomes a beautiful amenity to the landscape. Um, we also needed to reconfigure the transportation system. This is the current bus system. So I wish I had the map that had the vacancy underneath it because you'll see that most of the transportation is densest where people no longer live because it follows the old pattern of the city where the city grew from the center and out. And we just haven't recalibrated how it runs. Um, so instead, we started looking at, in the city, finally, and the region now has a regional transportation authority, um, is starting to look at something called bus rapid transit, um, which is, it could be a rail or a bus system, but it's moving much faster and at higher speeds with less stops, um, of how we can start to integrate these kind of systems, including this loop system, because it's very hard to get from east to west. Um, so that you actually have infrastructure where people are, where you actually have transportation where people are. And then the little diagram on the right is showing you that you can change the mode. So Detroit is heavily bus, and it's only one kind of bus, right? But what if it's a rapid transit bus? Um, what if it's a crosstown bus? What if they're feeder buses? What if they're micro buses? You know, like companies have vans that will take you from one place to your, for your place of work to your parking garage. But what if you can create entrepreneurial businesses that help people transport from our less big, our most vacant areas to main lines of transportation and create business opportunities? The green city is, like I said, moving to the multifunctional landscapes. Um, this is a map of the emergent or successional landscapes. So this is where green stuff is growing all over the city. The darker the green, the more stuff is growing. Again, this is what many of us would call weeds, but the city is already organically becoming green. The um, formal green in the city looks like this. And Detroit is woefully underrepresented in terms of green space. It's less than five acres of green space per thousand people. And you can see some of the stats on other cities that do much better than us. Washington, D.C. at 13, Boston at 9, even Baltimore at close to 9. Um, and as I said before, perhaps these ecologies can be doing some work for us. Instead of trying to get rid of them and mow them into lawns, perhaps we can really seed them into becoming new ecosystems that are doing good things for us. So I kind of talked about the different landscapes types that we have, community spaces, ecological landscapes, blue-green infrastructures, productive landscapes in our traditional recreational fields, and how these things can really begin to look and transform those vacancy areas into these new types of landscapes. So that the existing park system map 
uh, becomes a much more textured open space system map where the green spaces are doing more than one thing. Um, we also wanted to look at, because there is a lot of land that will be developed over time, that there are actually these fun landscape tools that we could do um, as temporary measures on some of our landscape spaces, like emergent forests, or orchards, or low-grow lawns, um, or phytoremediation, for example. And we created a whole matrix for decision makers to help them make decisions <coughs> about where you would deploy one type of landscape versus another. Lastly, the engaged city, building the capacity for change. This is critically important uh, because no one sector is responsible for doing everything that I just talked about. This is not all the responsibility of government. It's not all the responsibility of the community, of, of, of business leaders. Uh, it's impossible for the community organizations to do it by themselves. It's impossible for philanthropy to fund them on their own. It needs a collective civic community to get this done. And the good news is there's actually some good civic capacity in Detroit. Um, there's several new council districts. There are over 350 community-based organizations, close to 15,000 churches, many of them actively engaged in the city. It required our process to look at something called an integrated process. A lot of times, it's all about the technical team of experts coming in and doing this thoughtful work and presenting to the community, this is what I think you should do. One of the big lessons that we learned in Detroit is that there's something called community expertise. So as much as I have all these statistics about what's going on in your community, there's nothing like me going and talking to the residents in your community and having them tell me exactly what's going on. So I might get some stats that say, you know, these lights are on in this neighborhood. Whereas I go to the community and they're like, well, actually, no. <laughs> these five lights are out and they've been out for a year. And so that's real data to take in. And so it was very important, and it's a very important lesson, I think, for folks going out and doing this work, to create a value for the technical work as well as this community work, which you might think of as subjective or anecdotal, but it's real, it's experiential data, and it's valuable. The second lesson I would say is when we talk about community, it's important not to only think about that as residents. Community is a whole sector, a collection of sectors operating that make a city work, that move a city to change, that sometimes do things that aren't that good. It's residents, it's government, it's business, it's institutions, it's nonprofits, it's philanthropy, it's faith based, it's students, it's old people, young people. <laughs> And it's important that you distinguish these different constituents because they have different interests and they have different agencies. It's important to think about um, having conversations that are maybe geographically based. So you have communities of people who live in the same geographic space, but you also have communities that are based on different issues. Like this is a community of students, different from a community of senior citizens different from a community of folks who are interested in affordable housing. So it's important that you also vary, uh, vary your dialogues to distinguish those different cohorts. Another key lesson is that you vary the tactics for engagement. Uh, the traditional thing you hear about is some planners getting up and holding a big town meeting, or some planners going out and holding a community meeting and asking you what you want to say. Well, all of those different communities that I talk about, have different levels of understanding of the problems, different levels of experience of the problem, different levels of knowledge of the problem, different levels that they want to participate in the problem. So we did everything from on the bottom left here, we built this collapsible roaming table, and we take it out to bus stops, and we just talk to people like, have you heard about this process? <laughs> Very simple questions that at least elevated someone's knowledge that someone was thinking about the issues at hand all the way from open houses where we would just invite people and we'd have huge displays of what was going on and they would rotate throughout the process so they would always be updated. So if you were just curious and wanted to walk by, you could go in and see what was going on. To specific uh, community conversations where instead of us holding the meeting, we'd go out to other people's <laughs> meetings. Uh, to a, uh, a gaming exercise called Detroit 24-7, which over the course of three weeks, we prompted a series of questions and anyone could play. And the wonderful thing about this, if it's my next slide, is typically, particularly in my experience, when I, when I do this kind of civic participation, 
the average age of the people participating is me, like somewhere so between 30 and 50. Um, with the gaming, of all of the people who participated, 24% of them were between the ages of 18 and 24, which I just think was really extraordinary. Uh, most were women. This shows us the age range, which was pretty dispersed. Uh, shows us the um, racial and, and ethnic composition, which was actually pretty split, 46 to 30, much more equal than I thought. It was. <coughs> um, all in all, over the course of our two and a half years of the process, we engaged 163% uh, of the 700,000 folks that live and work in Detroit, which I think was really extraordinary. And so, all of this is to say, uh, Detroit is not going to die. Uh, we just need to think about Detroit in a different way. And what has been liabilities for the city in terms of its land and bankruptcy might actually be opportunities for a reset for really new and innovative thinking about how to make urban places. And we only have to remember Rome, which is probably our most famous shrinking city, which lost upwards of 70% of its population. Uh, during its major crisis, and I don't think we think of Rome as a shrinking city any longer. Thank you. Questions, comments? <clears throat> Please don't let me talk for an hour without the question. <laughs> yes? Um, did you guys think about how uh, um, Bell, um, the question was, did we think about Bell Isle? We thought about Bell Isle and that it was a really important open space asset. And it was really important to maintain it. And you may have read over the course of the last year and a half, lots of conversations about whether the state was going to take control over to help maintain it and so forth. So I think the whole community really values Bell Isle as an amenity. They want to see it improved and used more by the larger community. And the challenge now is who can maintain it and how to find the resources for it. But it seems to always be on the table as something important. Yes? What are you recommending for Detroit's extra-wide streets? Um, well, the question was, what were we recommending for Detroit's extra-wide streets? So the whole section uh, in the land use element of our plan that talks about a series of interventions where we take certain roads, what we call a road diet, in that we can start to take some of the lanes away and actually deploy some of that green infrastructure. A lot of those roads are very flat, and the stormwater management issue on them is pretty severe. So to the extent that we can, maybe we can turn the lights too, so I can see you, you can see me. Um, so um, a lot of what we wanted to do is transition some of that asphalt to green infrastructure. Um, in some of the areas where we really didn't see um, a traditional pattern of development happening, we thought that they could be eliminated altogether um, and either turned into some of those innovative landscapes that we talked about. Um, in some cases, perhaps the whole sort of street block configuration could change to make way for larger footprints for business or industrial or job producing uses. And so that's what I think the opportunity is. I think a lot of times we think that the canvas we have is fixed and you can't change it. And for us, we just sort of said, well, you know what? Why does the block, street block pattern in this part of town have to stay 200 by 300? Especially if we're trying to assemble land that maybe we want to bring a large manufacturing plant or something to the city or a large corporation that needs a huge piece of land and we don't have a lot of those assembled today. What if we reconfigured that area in a way to be more conducive to producing and attracting the kind of uses we want? And I think that's kind of the opportunity and the li liability man uh, mentality that we were hoping for. So we have a number of strategies uh, that are along those lines for different roads that would be reconfigured throughout the city. Thank you. Uh, can we look forward to seeing any of the ideas you um, Some of them are. So uh, the question was, is anything going to happen anytime soon? <laughs> Basically, um, there are several uh, blue green infrastructure projects that are underway. Um, the downtown midtown is actually seeing a lot of growth at the moment. Um, the employment district around Eastern Market is starting to see a lot of entrepreneurial businesses come up, so that kind of live make uh, strategy is underway. And again, if you go to the Detroit Works 
project or the Detroit Future City website, they kind of keep up to date with a number of things that are happening. So in each of those tracks, some of those small scale projects are moving forward. The city is also hoping to move forward with the uh, revision of their zoning and land use map. So regulatory change is underway too. Yes? I was wondering whether and if so, to what extent to use international examples to kind of inform the work you're doing in Detroit. So I'm referring to, for example, the German reunification mm -hmm. where you had a large outmigration of Eastern German cities. Yeah. So the question was, did, um, did we look at any international precedents? And the answer is, yes, we did. And, and we get a question a lot, which is, um, what would you compare Detroit to? And whether it's international or local, there's no city that has the exact same circumstances as Detroit. Um, but there are many cities around the world who have interesting ideas that could be deployed here. Um, we actually looked a lot at uh, Torino, Turin, Italy, uh, which very much mirrors Detroit as in a sister city kind of way, in that it was uh, Italy's automobile capital. So the Fiat, things like that there, and now there's a Fiat Chrysler relationship. Um, like Detroit in the 70s, it had a really difficult time uh, as the automobile industry tanked for the first time in this country, coupled with an oil crisis, and the city really went broke, and people fled the city you know, at rapid pace. Um, what was interesting about what they did, some of it's applicable, some of it's not. Um, one of the things that they did, and you'll hear this term, knowledge economy. So in addition to stabilizing the production manufacturing aspects of the automobile industry, they actually looked forward to linking it with the innovation part of transportation, right? So the folks who think about the next innovation of transportation, and they linked that to their university system. And so what ended up growing up around what was left of the automobile industry was this really robust, creative sector in technologies and, and a wide range of production technologies, um, some of which they call creative. So this industrial design industry really took off uh, of there. They also were able to take off in the food industry. So if you've heard of the slow food movement, the slow food movement grew up in and around Torino. Um, so their, the way they repositioned their economy was a really interesting lesson for us. The thing that wasn't so applicable, and I think is somewhat uniquely American, is that Torino is a really small, dense city. So while its population was similar and its economy was similar, you know, when we showed them the images of what we have, they just turned white, basically, because they had, it's such a luxury to think in any European city that you have that much space to play with. You know, they never really lost the fabric of the city, and somehow it made it easier, I think, for the physical city to return, even though there was economic collapse. Um, and then we, we did look at uh, the German a little bit, and mostly in the way in which they accepted the fact that they shrank and they weren't coming back. And they really did look at this kind of polycentric model of focusing in on nodes where it makes sense. And for us, the translation was, those nodes were going to be intra-city, not just regional. So those are two examples that we looked at. Yes? Um, I'm curious to know how you considered safety in your plans, just public safety in general. Yeah, that's a really hard topic because mostly when people ask that question, they want us to give them an operational answer. Right, which is, can we have more cops on the street? Can we have more police precincts, et cetera? And, and we kind of feel that part of the safety question is twofold. Part of the safety question is an economic question. So to the extent that young people don't have anything to do, productive, crime is going to ensue, likely. Right, and so how do we get young people more productive options for their lives? Right? And so a lot of this uh, that was looking at the distribution of employment <coughs> districts around the city, not just downtown, but within communities that still had things to do. The way we looked at creating new neighborhoods that would live make, that were really about home growing entrepreneurs. <coughs> right? So, so a, a guy or a woman comes out of prison and they were a barber or a beautician in prison. They can't come out of prison and get a barber's license. Right? So how do we change that kind of thing so a person who likely could be productive could by starting their own business? So economic
economic opportunity we think has something to do with safety. And then the other thing we think has to do with safety is the fact that we do have to get to more uh, denser neighborhoods, right? So not every neighborhood is going to be the same, again, nice, cozy, urban village. But we do, over time, have to give people more choices of viable neighborhoods in the city. So if you're living in that really high vacancy area, and over time, this, you're just not going to want to be there anymore, you have a choice to kind of come into a denser neighborhood. So part of the strategy is to figure out those areas that are viable right now in the next five years. How do you strengthen those and create more affordable choices within those so people can start in migrating? as opposed to moving out. And with, you know, there's safety in numbers and eyes on the street and all of that. So from a land use perspective, you know, uh, a spatial planning perspective, we wanted to introduce those two things as important to address the safety. Yes? I wonder how the city participates in the aspects of uh, rolling out the plan made you rethink anything um, that you come in with. When you come in with sort of a hypothesis, you come in with some strategies. So what one thing maybe really made you think we didn't get this right, we really need to change, change Well, the I mean, I, I, to admit your question just a little bit, I would say over the course of the three years, that input amended things. So it wasn't just we launched in January and then there was reaction and it was like, oh, we should rethink this. It was really sustained, and it was difficult, and it was long, and it was contentious at times. And I would say a couple of things that, um, that where this community expertise helped to weigh in um, was a couple of things. One, actually going to the neighborhood typology strategy was very much influenced by conversations that were happening on the ground through a community group called Community Development Advocates for Detroit. They were already beginning to think about, at a much smaller scale, not citywide, how, okay, this is kind of the landscape we have. We have some houses over here, we have a lot of vacancy over here. How can we make these things coexist and work together? And we kind of took those ideas and wanted to scale them up to a level that they can actually become regulatory. So that was a really important um, dialogue we had with folks who were working on the ground that changed a lot of what we were doing. Um, the civic engagement process itself change because of input. Um, specifically, um, some of our first meetings, uh, some of which did logistically were disasters because we had planned for 300 people and 1,000 people showed up, uh, which is a good problem to have, but in the moment it was very difficult. Um, people, when we started in 2010, people were really distrustful of government. Actually, people were distrustful of everything. People just, you know, community people <laughs> distrusted government. Government distrusted philanthropy. Business distrusted, I mean, there's just no love anywhere. <laughs> and for our team to kind of stand up at the first couple of meetings and say, you know, we're here to help, we, you know, lead you through a process was almost met with the equivalent of tomatoes being thrown at us. Um, and there was a real, you know, there, there were real conflicting kind of, uh, opinions about uh, we should try to bring in the best and brightest to help us versus we can do it ourselves, we don't want you here. There's a lot of insider outsider stuff. So one of the things that we amended was uh, the introduction of what we call process leaders. And, and this was to help us design the actual engagement itself. And so we brought in a number of civic and community leaders from around the city sit around the table with us and say, look, what's going to make this effective? You know your communities and your different constituents better than we do. How do they want to engage? How do they want to be informed? What do they know? What don't they know? And they ultimately became not just the advisors of what to do, but the face and the implementers of doing it. Right? So we would work with them to translate sometimes very technical data into ways that would be most useful for their <coughs> constituents. They would host the meeting. We would be there to answer questions or present a technical presentation, but they would run the dialogue. And what was helpful about that is not only being closer to the ground and understanding what was going to work in different communities, it was also a trusted face that people knew. And, you know, they argued with them too, and they threw tomatoes at them too. But these were people they were going to see in the grocery store the next day that they had a relationship with. So it helped us understand the importance of 
uh, civic engagement not being about a one-way dialogue, but being about relationships. And that was really pivotal in, in changing what we did. We have a very elaborate um, civic engagement uh, appendix, which I think is on the website, which documents all the inputs we got over the course of the two years. And it's relatively obvious to see how some of that input uh, is layered into the actual report. I think that the challenge now, I would say, since we've launched, uh, released the plan in January, is much like Wanda's quite Wanda? Wendy, sorry. Wendy's question, which is, okay, when am I going to see something happen? And so what has to happen now is how do you put in the implementation piece and build the capacity of people to be a part of implementation to move some of this good stuff forward? Uh, curious about the legacy cities work that you've done. Are there, did you find common themes or patterns in terms of what made for these legacy cities and what made for the loss of population? Um, generally speaking, um, population loss and job loss were the major contributors. I think the things that we've been documenting at, at, at post that is really what, what is it left on the ground. So we've been comparing their racial compositions, uh, we've been comparing their income weekend trends, we've been comparing their uh, residential vacancies and their overall vacancies, we've been comparing their residential densities uh, to see if they are experiencing the same things on the ground. Are they? Yes. Yeah, they're all pretty bad. And when you <laughs> they're, all, they're all pretty, you know, although, although I'll say this though, you know, not all le legacy cities are, you know, majority black. Right? We, we're finding, I'm sorry I can't quote the specifics, but we're finding a good number of them have fairly balanced um, uh, racial demographics, and a number of them tip towards the other way, in that they're majority not black communities, uh, depending on the scale of the city. So it's a, it's a real mix in terms of the people it's affecting, but then across all of those spectrums, they have a common income distribution.